Thank you all for having me. As I was saying to Clark just now, it is interesting to be on the other side of, of Beck, to be on the side of it. So um, as Dan mentioned, today I'm going to talk about the evolution of extra-community relationships in humans. And to think about that, let's start looking by looking at a couple papers that recently came out in PNAS and Proc B, respectively, talking about parochialism. In evolutionary anthropology in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of focus on parochialism, that is, in-group favoritism and generating out-group costs. What's interesting about this is that um, a lot of this research has been inspired partially by comparisons to chimpanzees, who are one of our closest living relatives. Um, but in the course of this research, what I'm going to suggest today is that we may have been overlooking some other important aspects of human sociality. And that includes relationships that are potentially peaceful with other um, members of other groups. So to take a bit of a counterintuitive example, just to kind of use starting, um, started thinking about this, the Anamamo are often used as an ethnographic example of a human group that is engaged in a lot of warfare. What's interesting about the Anamamo is that they're selective in who they are competitive with. So while they may compete with certain other communities, other communities say with community A, I'm, I'm competitive. Community B may actually be an allied community and they build these relationships through exogamous marriage. So they are competitive with other communities in one domain, but then in another domain they may have friendships between communities. Another group that's often thought of as being kind of territorial and a bit more defensive, several different groups actually, the Pacific Northwest peoples um, from the US and from Canada are known for being territorial, at least in certain conditions, of salmon runs, but they're also um, the host to many intra-ethnic and interlinguistic um, relationships and trade, trade relationships. And so this isn't something that's just limited to humans. If we look at other um, great apes, for example, at gorillas, um, intergroup interactions can be both competitive and can be tolerant in their outcomes. And the same is true for many non-ape primate species. And so today, the first observation I'd like to make is that humans are actually plastically parochial. And in fact, that's something that these two top papers end up concluding, um, these new papers in Proc B and in PNAS. And further, somehow we manage to live in, in multi-level societies. And so what I'd like to talk about today is, first of all, why are humans so tolerant towards outgroup members? Why is the prevalence of tolerance in humans so high relative to other non-human primates? And second of all, what are the ecological and social factors that may increase or decrease the payoffs to being tolerant towards someone in a different social group? So today, um, I'll be talking about my research program. In my research program, I study this from a bunch of different angles, evolutionary, uh, the evolution of extra community relationships. The first thing I'll do today is walk you through a new paper that is under review, um, basically looking at the selection pressures favoring tolerance in intergroup encounters in non-ape primates. And then I will use the frameworks from that literature and apply that to great apes and to humans and see how far we can get using those frameworks to explain what's going on in the great apes and um, specifically within the great apes in humans. To give you a quick spoiler up front, it seemed like these models do a better job explaining the prevalence, sorry, the plasticity of, um, of tolerance in humans, that is the variability in, in how tolerant we are towards other groups, but maybe not so much the prevalence, and I'll explain why. Then I'll walk you through um, basically thinking about non-local resource access and how that may be key in humans in terms of upregulating tolerance, and this may be why we see so much of it in humans. And I'll compare resource access to other pathways that may increase um, interest in extra community relationships in the second part of the talk. A little spoiler here, um, all these pathways actually matter, these pathways that I'll be talking about today, not just resource access. And then finally, given that individuals are interested in relationships that span community or group boundaries, how do they pick new partners? with members of these groups. Are they using the same criteria as they are for in-group members? That's something I'll cover last, and the answer up front is both yes and, and no. It depends on the, the criterion. All right, so the first thing to do today is to define our terms. So we're gonna focus on the individual level today and think about individuals as part of, of groups. And whether or not individuals are interacting with other groups may be something that um, depends on the individual and features of that individual. But for the purposes of uh, the talk today, individual, sorry, groups are uh, individuals who remain together in and separate from other units, and they mostly interact with each other. This is a very kind of classic definition from primatology. 
But in humans, I will actually use the word community more frequently than I'll use the word group because groups are very complicated in humans, particularly in this day and age with the internet and so forth. And what a group is, is really changing rapidly. So we'll talk about residential units for the most part with humans. An intergroup encounter is basically defined as visual contact between at least one member of each of, of two different groups. And if we have two groups that are regularly associating together, it may be that they're part of a multi-level society. And while I won't go into multi-level societies too much today, um, it's something to be aware of that this is part of this larger literature on multi-level societies in primates. Okay, so to get us thinking about this, let's think first about in-group members, conspecifics who are living in the same group. So we're gonna focus here on individual X, and what we're gonna ask is how should this focal individual behave towards another target conspecific? And of course, this depends on the relative benefits and costs of different kinds of behavior. The first question we can ask is, is there anything worth fighting over? For example, there may be a food resource over which these um, individuals can compete. Maybe if they are two males, they might be fighting over a female who's an estrus at that time. And so what we can then do is ask, is there anything worth fighting over? And we'll use this two by two matrix to kind of organize our thinking about the behaviors we should see. If the answer is yes, we're over here in this left hand column. And if it's no, we're over here in the right, just to kind of get us thinking about um, these different options. So in the left, we might see something like aggression or active avoidance when two individuals avoid each other because the cost of interaction and aggressing may be too high. Whereas in the right, we might see tolerance or even just encounters happening at random. So given there's nothing worth fighting over, say we're in this right-hand column, why would individuals stay in association? Given, say, they randomly run into each other, why should they actually come back and interact once again? Well, there may be benefits to doing so. First of all, they might be close kin. Maybe they're inclusive fitness benefits to be gained from being in association. Potentially, one is a male, one's a female. There could be mating opportunities. There could be friendship opportunities. Even the female might be hanging out with a male so that infanticide risk is lower. Or they might co-defend a resource. If resource is particularly large, maybe they will uh, we'll form an alliance to defend a food resource or say a female who's an asterisk. And something to remember here is that the affordances of being in association are not consistent across time. For example, if two males are together defending a female who's an estrus, she's not gonna be an estrus forever. And so when that time period ends, they may, not, uh, may, they may no longer have incentives to remain in association. So returning to our two by two matrix down here, the other question that we're gonna ask today is, is there any reason to run into each other, um, either for a long period of time or repeatedly? If the answer is yes, we're here in this top column. And if the answer is no, we're here in the bottom. And today what we're gonna to try to do is to kind of zero in on this top right-hand corner of tolerance. <coughs> when are contest incentives towards another conspecific low, but incentives for encounter are high. So let's turn now towards extra, um, extra group members, other members of other groups. So first of all, is there anything worth fighting over? And we're gonna focus here on this second column um, when the contest incentives are low. So first of all, to think about this um, simply, we can think about the local resource ecology. Um, if resources are kind of evenly distributed across the landscape, there may not be a lot of incentive to defend a particular resource. To give you an example, um, let's talk about one genus, uh, snub-nosed monkeys who are living mostly in East Asia. Tonkin snub-nosed monkeys usually are hanging out in one male units, and they're more distributed across the landscape where their foods are, are uh, located, which is kind of all over the place as compared to black snub-nosed monkeys who feed on these large lichen patches that can basically host multiple bands and clans of snub-nosed monkeys. We can even think about this within a single species across different seasons. So for, if we think about Hamadryas baboons, at one part of the year they might be focused on acacia trees when one male units, that is one male and the associated females are hanging out at, at a given acacia tree and there aren't any other groups around. Versus different times of the year, when palm fruits are available, you can get large groups of Hamadryas baboons associating together in these palm forests. So in this case over here on the right, what we have is we have a resource that is so big and concentrated in one place that there may not be anything worth fighting over. Instead, you can get these intergroup encounters 
where there are enough resources per capita go around, to go around, so therefore people might not, um, people, pardon me, individuals may not be fighting over them, and that resources may be too concentrated in one place to defend even with an alliance. This can be similar as well for female defense. So in some species of non-human primates, um, males may engage in female defense. Over here we have an example of kind of more evenly distributed females across the landscape in the case of gelatas who are mostly eating grass. They're a bit all over the place, but harder for males to defend. They have to engage in, in herding behavior. This is different in the case of Mariki. So females will actually cluster together in large groups that make ma it harder for males to defend them and to monopolize matings. And so in the right-hand case, again, what we have is we have the resource, in this case females, are too concentrated to be easily defended. This lowers the incentive for contests between groups. Now, given that we're over here in this right-hand column, again, we're, we're interested in, in arriving at tolerance. So is there any reason to stay in association? It's one thing to have an incentive to fight, but then given that two individuals run into each other, why should they remain in that association? A couple benefits I'll highlight here. If you, uh, if you want to see more, uh, go ahead and see my paper. It's on, um, on this topic. It's on my website. So if there are these large um, resource patches, for example, in the cases of, of proboscis monkeys, they have sleeping sites that they really value. They will basically associate with other groups to defend those sleeping sites. So joint defense can be one of these benefits of remaining in association. Social learning can also happen between groups, so ecological knowledge can spread from one group to another. This can happen both within species and between species. You can see interspecific associations to kind of pick up these, the social information. And additionally, intergroup transfers can take place in the context of these associations. This happens in ring-tailed lemurs, for example, who will engage in visits and sometimes come back or transfer if they like the other group. And extra pair copulations can often take take place when there's an intergroup encounter. So these are some of the benefits that can come from being in association between two different groups. Now the question I'd like to ask is how far can we get by using this framework from non-ape primates and applying it to the non-human great apes and to humans? Can we understand the plasticity and the prevalence of tolerance in intergroup encounters in these species using this framework? So it ends up that we know quite a bit about intergroup encounters in chimpanzees, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Intergroup encounters in chimpanzees are invariably hostile, um, and we have evidence for this from a lot of different chimpanzee sites. And there are a number of explanations, but what it seems like is going on is that resources can be clumped into one space, usually not very densely, but um, in, a, in a defensible manner. And females will fight over this, they'll aggress over resource access. Males will engage in female defense polygyny where they'll defend these females and their resources and they're doing this with closely related other males who are living in the same social group. One of the reasons that chimpanzees are able to make this system work is that males are basically sharing in paternity among the females they're defending. And as you can see over here, all these close circles are chimpanzees and compared to the bonobos that I'm about to mention, they're sharing a more, um, more even, not entirely even, but more even amount of the uh, paternities, basically, of the, the offspring that are born to this group. So they're getting collective action off the ground because they're sharing in the reproductive uh, affordances of this collective action. With bonobos, it's a different story, which is pretty interesting. So again, we have closely related males in a group but what's happening is that some of these males are really dominating the reproductive events. And this may partially be because female bonobos have a lot of choice. They cluster together in large groups that are difficult to defend and basically seem to be able to ward off a lot of male herding behavior. Further, bonobos use different um, food resources than do chimpanzees. Some of these food resources are particularly clumped into one place. But what's interesting about bonobos is we actually don't know that much about their foraging ecology. There's a lot more work to be done. So why do bonobos remain in association when they run into each other? They're often together for days or weeks once they do. And this is something that's an active field of research for bonobo researchers. It's something we need to know more about. In the case of gorillas, especially western gorillas, they're much more likely to have intergroup encounters than eastern gorillas. Western gorillas are running into each other at these large resource patches called bays. They're very mineral dense and, and resource dense. It's very hard to exclude other individuals from these, these resources, but individuals do <coughs> remain in association there. 
This may be partially um, mediated by the fact that different gorilla males may be related to one another. This is something we need to know more about, so ongoing research in that department would be very useful. And females may have incentive to remain in these encounters because this gives them opportunity to transfer between different troops. So there are a couple different uh, factors that may push towards remaining in intergroup encounters in the case of gorillas. In the case of, uh, sorry, really quickly, um, we're not going to talk about orangutans today, unfortunately. Um, they're also very interesting, but defining social groups in orangutans is very difficult. They spend a lot of time in um, solitary conditions, so we're going to leave them aside for this talk. So with humans, I think that we can actually get um, a fair ways thinking about plasticity um, in tolerant behavior in humans in the context of, of non-human primate models. So when resources are, are clumped but not a very high density, you can get defense by a single community or by a few individuals in an alliance. When resources are very dense in the case of humans, for example, in Eastern California, when resource availability near Fort Irwin all kind of came about at the same time, this is in the archeological record, you have different ethno-linguistic groups who are using these resources in basically what looks like a collective action common pool system where they're not running into each other, but they are um, all using it and no one is excluding the other. In systems like this as well, where you have really clustered resources, you can also get active defense between different communities. In the case of the Turkana, for example, lots of different communities will come together to engage in raids and engage in defense. So this is another way to, to guard these resources. So when you have these large resources, what often happens in the ethnographic record is humans will come together in large aggregations. It's a time for negotiating marriages, intergroup transfers take place, some extra pair copulations. Um, and so this is something that is then fostered by encounters at large, large clumped resources. And given you have these encounters, you can also pick up social information and traded resources as well. So in terms of plasticity, I think we can learn quite a bit from non-human primate models for what's going on in humans with tolerance. But the question that I have is why is tolerance so prevalent in humans relative to um, our closest relatives, for example, bonobos, gorillas, and chimpanzees? We're in a multi-level society. We're in the middle of Los Angeles at the moment. We've managed to pull this off, this intergroup tolerance, um, at quite remarkable levels. So what is this? What are the drivers of this, this pattern in humans? What I'd like to suggest is that the human foraging ecology actually may have kicked off the importance of extra community relationships. So some resources on, on which we focused a lot as evolutionary anthropologists have been things like forage resources or farmed resources or things like, like hunted resources that have quite a bit of variability but that we can buffer with neighbors or with same, community, same household members in, in our communities. This is not the same for all human resources, however. So things like watering holes, once they're depleted, in the human case, you can't actually go to your neighbors or to someone in your household and, and get more water. You have to go a little bit further out to have access to that. And further, access to things like salt, which is very clumped and in only particular places in the landscape, may never be available locally. So calling on someone in a different community may be really crucial to deal with both shortfalls in local resources and with resources that are never available locally. The affordances of these have potentially been so great, these extra community relationships in humans, that we have cultural institutions that then reinforce these relationships. Exogamy is a really good example, particularly in the case here of the Yanomamo. Potlatches were very useful for building up these networks in the Pacific Northwest peoples. And to give you a couple more familiar examples, you also may know Xaro Exchange from the San. So this kind of gift giving network that crosses the boundaries of communities and up to 150 to 200 kilometers in distance can keep open these risk buffering networks across different communities living at, at distances that may give you access say to water that you wouldn't have otherwise. Same thing is true for the cooler ring. If you're familiar with this, Malinowski wrote the, about this in the early 20th century. Basically keeping gift giving relationships open between different islands can provide resource access. Same thing is true now for godparent relationships in Latin America. It's a great way to build relationships that span community boundaries. So humans have used cultural institutions to further draw on the benefits that can be afford afforded by extra community relationships. So just to recap here, what I've suggested is that non-ape primates give us a bit of an idea of the plasticity, particularly in humans, in tolerance between different groups. 
In great apes, we can get an understanding, I think, of both plasticity and prevalence, given that we have the right data. With gorillas and bonobos, I think there's a lot more to be learned about intergroup encounters. So while we can say, yes, it looks like non-ape uh, frameworks do a good job at explaining what's going on in the great apes, I think there's more to know. And in humans, again, there's a lot of different things that we're doing with individuals from other communities, from extra pair copulations to trade to learning. And I believe that the prevalence of extra community relationships in humans and the tolerance we see may have initially been kicked off, among other things, by non-local non resource access and the importance of that. And today, this also extends to things like market resources. So we need additional explanatory models on top of what we have from non-ape primates to talk about what's going on in humans. OK, so moving on to the next part of the talk, the first thing I'm going to ask is, is it true that non-local resources are the key to explaining prevalence in humans? If we look at a case study in Bolivia, I'm going to talk a bit about these populations I work with in Bolivia. Is this what's going on, or do we see additional pathways through which interest in extra community relationships can be augmented? So non-local resource access, as I have suggested, could be one of these things that upregulates interest in non-local relationships. Other things that might do this could be, for example, lowering the costs of building these relationships in the first place. For example, if you're trying to build a relationship across a linguistic boundary, it helps if you can speak the language, right, or at least have a couple opening words. So, for example, individuals who go and have maybe the wrong opening with an outgroup member are not going to get the predicted response and will have a difficult time forming that relationship. So having shared norm systems can really grease the wheels for getting these relationships off the ground. Further, individuals who spend more time away from home and exposed to individuals in other communities may be at greater risk, as it were, of forming these relationships. And what I'm going to do here is pull in a couple of different literatures. The idea of superordinate identity is coming from psychology. It's the idea that individuals who are exposed to a larger social world may identify with a larger social world. This is very similar also to the concept of cosmopolitanism from political science and from sociology. And so the idea, again, here is that individuals who are more exposed um, to others are more at risk of forming these relationships. So just to recap, individuals from other communities may provide access to non-local resources. May, it may be easier to form relationships with them if you share a norm system in common. And you may be at more risk of forming relationships with those in other communities if you are exposed to them more frequently. So to what extent do each of these three pathways explain what's going on in humans? To do this, I'm going to switch our focus to Bolivia. So I work in Bolivia with three populations of horticulturalists. They all live here in lowland Bolivia. And to give you a sense of where we are located, this is the Peruvian border right here. And here's the capital, La Paz. This is Lake Titicaca. So these three populations are all, all horticulturalists. What that means is that they're growing some cultivated crops, but they're also engaging in foraging and hunting as well in the local area. Um, they grow plantains, they live on rivers, they grow rice, they have domestic animals, but they differ in a lot of other respects. The first of the three populations is the Chimane. The Chimane is the least, are the least market integrated of the three populations, and they are mostly still speaking their, their native language. They're relatively isolated from those who are around them, including Bolivian nationals and other members of, of these two groups I'm about to talk about. The Mosa Ten, um, have intermarried at length, uh, sorry, intermarried throughout the past at length, yes, that also, with the Chimane. Uh, they speak a different dialect of the same linguistic isolate, um, and they have very similar cultural practices. But what's happened is that the Mosa Ten were uh, effectively missionized about two centuries ago. So these days they're speaking predominantly Spanish, their language is being lost, and they're engaging in many more market transactions than are the Chimane. The interculturals are also another community. They're basically located right next to the Mosa Ten. These are individuals who have migrated from the highlands to the lowlands. They're now engaging in horticulture, but they've brought with them some of their more Andean cultural institutions, which are often very cooperative and, and based on a lot of collective action. So they're engaging the same mode of production, but with a very different cultural background. So these three populations differ, as I mentioned, quite a bit in their market participation and in their incomes. And for this portion of the talk, I'm actually just going to focus on the Mosa Ten and the interculturals because it's comparing more apples to apples. The Shimane are engaging with individuals and in other um, linguistic and ethnic groups at a much lower rate. 
things are changing rapidly in this region as well. So I've been working with the Mosaten in the intercultural since 2012. And even in just the last two years, incomes now, as of this spring, were, are 60% of what they were, 160% of what they were two years ago. So things are really changing rapidly. Migration is really high. And now in households, when I first started working with these groups, um, only 50% of households had cell phones, just a single cell phone per household. Now we're at at least 95% of households have one cell phone. So the interesting thing too about these market goods is that while some of them can be purchased in the local town, others are actually frequently purchased in the capital city, which give you a sense of the increasing mobility in this region. Okay, so turning back to these three different pathways, non-local resource access, shared norms, and superordinate identity. How do I measure these three things in these populations? I used proxies in all three cases, and in the first case what I did is I asked a sample of pilot participants to identify the possessions that were important for having a good life. I then asked my main sample participants, those who are doing most of the study, whether they had access to these resources, how many of them they owned. Those who had more have more non-local resource access than those who have fewer. For shared norms, what I did on this, on this count is because we're interested here in market norms and the ability to kind of cross these boundaries, I asked about market knowledge. So for locally produced items, um, depended on the community, but between 11 and 15 items, I asked for the current price of those items. And then assuming that this kind of hive brain of these communities is accurate at actually tracking the local markets, I used moving averages from seven days, a seven day window, three days before and three days after the, the interview. And I looked at how much a given participant deviated from the average guess at the price for, say, plantains during those seven days. Individuals who deviated more were considered to have less market knowledge. Those who were more accurate were considered to have more. Then finally, thinking about superordinate identity, I asked where individuals had been in other parts of Bolivia and outside of Bolivia, and basically who looked at the proportion of their life that they had spent in other areas of Bolivia and outside of the country. Those who had been away more, a larger proportion of their life, were then considered to have more exposure to uh, extra community members. Okay, so just to walk through some three hypotheses here for these different pathways. Just to reiterate, individuals who have no less non-local resource access are expected to be more interested in building relationships with those living in a distant community to try to get access to the affordances of, of what they have over there. Individuals who have shared norms, right, who have this more market knowledge, more of these should be expected to be somewhat indifferent between forming in-group or say same ethnicity versus other ethnicity relationships because the costs of forming the two relationships should be about the same. Then finally, superordinate identity. Individuals who have spent more time away from home, with a caveat here that I'll come back to, should be more interested in distant community individuals by dint of having more past exposure to them. So measuring this in Bolivia, what I did is I presented individuals with two different options, one on the left and one on the right, and asked who they would prefer as a new friend, the person on the left or the person on the right. Six different categories are on each of these cards, six different qualities of these friends. And I basically banked on the fact that I knew something about these participants. For example, I knew where they lived, and I also knew their ethnic group. So what I could do then is you then compare the, the focal person's identity and where they live with what's on the card. So for example, here on the left-hand card, we have someone who lives on the other side of the valley from the focal individual, that would be a distant community. So a distant community friend, if they pick the left, that's a preference they're exhibiting. And, oops, going backwards here, they're also a different ethnicity, they're Quechua as opposed to Mosaten. In this case, if you pick another ethnic, a card with a different ethnic group on it or with a distant community, that's considered a choice for the positive poll here. And you'll see on the upcoming slides that what I have is our plots that basically show the probability of picking the positive poll, that is the distant or other ethnic group individual. The 50% line is the line of indifference, where they're indifferent between picking the left and right card, the distant or close individual. And so, for example, if they're above the line, that's showing a preference for a distant community individual, and below would be showing a preference for the same community. Also on the card, you'll see that I have trustworthiness, goodness, and wealth. This is something I'll talk about in the next portion of the talk, so stay tuned. But these things are also important in choosing a new friend. So one of the things I like about these methods is that I, I know things about 
these focal individuals' social networks. I know the friendships and the relationships they have that cross community boundaries. I have those data. What's nice about these data is that they remove the constraints on choice. So individuals may have had fewer or more opportunities to build these relationships in the past. And so what I'm seeing is an instantiation of a long history of potential interactions. What this kind of method does is experimentally removes constraints on choice and asks them, in an ideal world, who would they pick as a friend? And so that's why I'm using these methods here for picking a new partner. All right, so non-local resources. First, we're going to look at this model. Here's a reminder if you ever get lost about what the predictions are in this part of the talk. And I have results for all six um, categories. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this. But if you have interest in a particular category, let me know after the talk, and I can go over the results with you. One thing I would like to highlight, though, is that in all three of these comparative models, I'm going to compare three, is that having a good friend is always the most important thing. And by good, I mean this is someone who's open and friendly. It's um, una buena persona, buena gente in Spanish. So uh, someone who's a good person is the number one quality that individuals are picking for. So first off, non-local resources. The prediction here is that individuals who have less access to resources, non-local resources, should be more interested in individuals living in a distance. That is what we see. So they are more likely to pick individuals living at a distance if they themselves have fewer access, uh, less access to resources. But what I would like to note is that the 95% credible intervals here are pretty large. There's some uncertainty in this model. It doesn't include 50%, but only over here on the side. So this is trending as opposed to a really strong relationship. And just in case you're interested, I'll show you the, the data for ethnicity is trending in the same direction, but with even larger error in terms of, of these estimates. For shared norm systems, again, this is based on market knowledge. Individuals who have more market knowledge are trending towards more interest in individuals living in other ethnic groups. And remember here that I actually predicted that there would be no preference, basically a flat line across the entire plot. But we do see that there's a large amount of error, right? So there's a trend, but the error bars are, if you will, are quite large. And in case you're interested, um, we actually see the opposite direction here, but again, with large amounts of uncertainty in the estimates for individuals living at a distance. Finally, thinking about superordinate identity, individuals who had spent a larger proportion of their lives away were trending towards interest in individuals living at a distance in terms of a new, a new friend, but with some uncertainty, again, we're including the 50%, this indifference line here, so no clear preferences popping out of that. Ethnicity looks pretty much flat, so not in the prediction, but again, if you were interested in that, that's how that, uh, that pattern looks. So again, here were our predictions and the results. So we find that non-local resources, the fewer non-local resources an individual has, the more interested they are in a distant community individual. Trending, but that was one of the more, um, of the three models, that's the only one that has uh, credible intervals that don't include the 50% line. Shared norm systems actually trended towards increasing interest in other, sorry, in um, other ethnic group relationships. And for superordinate identity, that is any exposure to other individuals, we see that there's a trend towards interest in individuals living at a distance. One thing that I'll note here is I still have that little asterisk. What we didn't analyze in this paper is whether positive exposure to other community individuals was what really mattered. And that's going to be the, the basic basis of our, of our upcoming paper on the same topic. I have those data, but we haven't analyzed them yet. So again, top model is the one that had 50%, uh, sorry, 95% credible intervals that didn't include the 50% line. However, all three models have very similar AIC values. So they're doing similar jobs in terms of explaining the variance in the data. They're doing similarly good or bad jobs, as it were. So interesting, all three pathways seem to be, have something going on, but there seems to be more going on than what we're capturing here in these models. All right, so let's turn to the third part of today's talk. Given that individuals are interested in forming relationships across ethnic boundaries, across community boundaries, how are they picking these new partners? What are the partner choice criteria that they're using to make these decisions? So we know, for example, that these three pathways here on the top may matter um, in terms of predicting interest in these relationships. But picking among individuals may be another task entirely. So, for example, if we have our focal individual over here who's interacting with other community members, they may differ in individual characteristics. 
One may be more productive. This is something that has been shown to matter very much in in-group partner choice is their levels of productivity. They may also differ in the resource access they have and their own personal wealth. And they may differ in qualities of, uh, that are related to cooperative intent, for example, how friendly they are. Further, the focal individual may not be able to trust them. So trustworthiness may be another component of, of that. So thinking about these individual level criteria, for example, resource access and cooperative qualities, do these qualities that are preferred among outgroup partners differ from those preferred among in-group partners? Do we see different criteria being used in each of these partner choice uh, scenarios? So I also measured this in Bolivia. I took these to all three populations, the Chimane, the Mosaten, and the Interculturals to ask this question and figure out what people's preferences were. The first thing I actually needed to do in this case is to figure out who was in-group and who was out-group. And in this portion of the talk, I'm going to focus more on ethno-linguistic boundaries and on religious boundaries. So I presented individuals with cards that represented local groups, groups that were big enough to contain strangers. This includes here religious groups, like here we have the Catholics, the Quechua is an ethnic group. We also have work cooperatives. Bolivia has a big history of socialism, and so there are work cooperatives in terms of dairying and pig farming. I then presented individuals with a Likert scale, a physical Likert scale, where they're closest to one box at one end, and there's another box at the other end that's further away from them. I asked them to place in this first square the groups that they felt they belonged to most, and in the last square those they felt they belonged to least. So if we just imagine here that we're sorting, this individual feels that they're not Catholic, maybe a little bit, not Shimane or Quechua, but that they feel that they're part of the pig farming group and that they're most of 10. So then what I did is I pulled an example group from one of the first two squares as a, an example in group and from one of the last two squares as an example out group. I selected photos that I had taken from previous participants in the study that were in either say this in group here the most of 10 or out group there the Chimane, three examples of each. First thing I did was ask the participant if these individuals were known to them. If they were, I changed the photos. So this is basically, we have six photos of strangers here. I introduced each photo to the participant, name, age, and their group membership. Then I allocated three coins, each one of which was worth 14 and a half US cents across these six photos and a pile of three in front of the participant, his or him or herself. And I should note that the stakes here, it's about a third of a day's wage locally. So decently large, but not huge stakes. I then told the participant that they could move any coins they wished. They could move coins from their own pile and give it to someone in a photo. They could take coins from a photo for themselves, or they could move coins between photos. Anything they wanted was fair game. I wasn't going to look. I turned away and did something else while they were doing this task. But what I told them is that at the end of the task, when they're ready, just let me know and any coins that they left on top of a photo would go to that person in their name. So what we have here is basically an economic game, as it were. It's a dictator game, but with six different potential recipients. And on one, in one direction, it's non-anonymous. So if I give money to Daniel, for example, Daniel will learn who I am. He'll learn that Ann Pizer gave him this amount. This is also a, a technique that I picked because I like that this removes constraints on choice. So this kind of gives um, individuals an opportunity to make an opening volley of generosity if they choose to with a new social partner. Then afterwards, um, and this is a caveat you can read more about in the paper, afterwards is uh, so a bit complicated, I asked participants about their uh, perceptions of, say, Daniel here in the first photo. Does he seem wealthy? Does he seem friendly? Does he seem like a good person? Um, and then I recorded these responses. So we'll look at, at those results. Finally, I made good on what I, uh, I promised and I gave the money back to the recipients at the end of the field season in the person's name. Just to remind you, what we're investigating here are the individual level criteria of partner choice with in-group and out-group members. Resources and cooperative qualities are going to be our foci for today. If you're interested in group level qualities and how those affected choice, that's also in the paper. Okay, first part. Donors actually gave less to wealthy in-group strangers, but with a big caveat on this one. So the question was, do you think this person has a lot of money, a little money, or no money? And how did that predict the amount that a focal um, individual gave to that recipient? 
it ends up that for in-group members over here on the bottom left, individuals seemed at first pass to be preferentially um, giving money to less wealthy uh, in-group members and giving, less, uh, giving more to less wealthy and giving less to more wealthy in-group members. However, what it seems to be is actually a bit of presentation bias. So if I instead look um, at what everyone else in my sample said about a focal, sorry, um, about a given recipient. So say we're talking here about Daniel. What did everyone in the sample say about Daniel when they were asked the same question? If I exclude the participant, this, this focal person right here, and look at what everyone else said, what everyone else said was actually a positive predictor of how much the participant gave to Daniel. So what is actually going on here, I believe, is that individuals, because this was after they'd given money to be consistent with their decisions, told me they gave money because the individual was less wealthy, therefore more deserving. But it actually ended up that they were biasing giving towards individuals who seemed more wealthy, and they were detecting something in the face in these photos that everyone else in the sample was also detecting. So in fact, what we have here is biased giving towards wealthy in-group members with a bit of self-presentation bias. Now, turning to cooperative qualities, trustworthiness. Can you trust the person in the photo a little, do you think, a lot, or not at all? We see biased giving of coins towards in-group members, but not out-group members, basically sitting right there on the zero line. So individuals who are playing this game prefer to give money to trustworthy in-group members, but that feature of individuals is not playing into out-group partner preferences. Then finally, good person. Again, in Spanish, this is buena gente. It's the exact same pattern we saw show up with the other method I, I showed in the last paper we discussed. And in both in-group and out-group partner choice, we see being a good person mattering more than, than anything else. So this is something that's a big predictor of giving, and it's a big predictor of giving towards both in-group and out-group members. So just to recap here, what did we actually see? In the case of wealth, wealthy in-group members were actually preferred as recipients of money, but this was hidden beside self-presentation bias, so it took a bit of digging. Trustworthy in-group members were also preferred, but this preference did not show up in out-group members. And finally, goodness reigns supreme, both for in-group and out-group partner choice. So this is a criterion that seems to be at play in both cases. All right, so we've covered a lot. So I started out this talk by thinking about selection pressures that would favor tolerance in intergroup encounters in non-human primates, specifically in non-ape primates. And then I used this framework, took it to uh, great apes and um, non-human great apes and to humans, and asked to what extent does this explain tolerance that we see in, in these species and in humans, the variability that we see. In humans, I suggested that the initial pressures towards buffering risk um, that's occurring at the local level, local shortfalls, basically favored uh, extra community relationships and tolerance towards individuals in other communities that were later solidified by cultural institutions. Actually, I won't say later solidified, let's say solidified. I'm not going to come down strongly in the later or not. That could have happened at the same time. And that in great apes, it looks like uh, non-ape primate models do a good job at explaining plasticity and prevalence of tolerance in their case. However, we don't have enough data to really um, have a strong opinion on that, particularly in the case of gorillas and bonobos. In terms of non-local resource access, how does this hold up if we look at Bolivia, contemporary Bolivia with three populations of, of horticulturalists? How does resource access stack up relative to other pathways that can increase or decrease interest in extra community individuals? What we found is that all three of these pathways that we considered, and that, again, to recap, was non-local resource access, um, shared norm systems, right, and subordinate identities all did some work in terms of explaining the variability in these models, but none of them is a home run in terms of um, this is the pathway that seems to be driving most of the effect. And then finally, given interest in outgroup relationships, how are people picking outgroup partners? What we saw is that while we have specific criteria that matter for picking an in-group partner, particularly wealth and trustworthiness, being a good person matters the most in terms of both groups and something we saw in terms of both methods here. Caveat here, of course, is that this was all using coins, and that in and of itself can be a little complicated in terms of interpretation. So big picture here. Uh, buffering non-local resource access was probably really important in humans, both in our ancestors and with contemporary uh, resource access, for example, in market integrating populations in Bolivia. We see that non-local resource access matters 
in the Bolivian context for predicting what's going on, but so do two other pathways. And in terms of individual qualities, we see that for in-group members, resource access and trustworthiness are important, but when it comes to both in-group and out-group partner choice, being a good person reigns supreme. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you to a number of people, and particularly the three uh, populations with whom I work in Bolivia and my funders, and thank you for your time. Yeah, so first off, two, two big limitations of this, of this framework. So while I liked the economic game approach here in terms of kind of letting people put their money where their mouth was, there were some complications. First of all, it involves money, um, and that was a big thing, especially with the Chimane who have, as you saw, the least money of all three populations. Um, there's self-presentation bias, because I asked that question afterwards, and they're relying on just photos for information, which is not something that's normal in this <coughs> ecological context. The Chimane and the Mosaten do run into each other. There's actually a region where they run into each other and live in the same communities together. That's just a little, little bit distant from where I currently am. What I think would be really be interesting also is to have the actual ratings of individuals. Someone who knows them gives me all the ratings of, of how they are as a person, and then I use that to predict giving. So um, that may or may not be with photos. I think photos kind of introduce a little bit of um, bias. They're literally kind of flat, as it were. There's not a lot of 3D to, that, to the person. Um, the problem for me is always trying to figure out what, people, how, what kind of friend um, decisions people would make in the absence of any kind of structural constraints, basically. Um, this card method I found to be a little bit better for that, actually, than the photos. So yeah, I think that actually having ratings of other individuals and then using that to predict giving or predict choices of, of partners, maybe in, in real life, would be more fruitful than this, you know. Yeah, Dan. So in, in the same methods, I mean, there's a little bit of information in the face about trustworthiness, not mm -hmm. a lot. Um, people, but what matters is that people believe that information and certainly in, you know, Western undergraduate samples right. that have been studied, people are reasonably confident in their judgments of trustworthiness. So doesn't actually matter whether that's accurate for your purposes here. But you, you pointed out that there seem to be some cues of wealth that people are picking mm -hmm. up in the photographs. Another dimension which you didn't discuss, and I wonder if you considered, is cues of dominance that are present right. in the face. Because they, they're the, I mean, the, the sort of evolutionary depth, the, the phylogenetic depth for the, um, the notion that people should be able to read some of the cues is, is quite large. Right. And so it's not so much about whether people perceive and believe something that is or isn't true, as much as it is that they're, you know, they're probably cues of underlying hormonal and genetic contributors to dominance that um, are reasonably accurate. So that could conceivably be a consideration, either for positive or for negative, depending on um, what the strategic optimum is in seeking an outgroup partner. Right. And it, which may depend on the person themselves, for example, what is their dominance, yeah. which is something I would need to know. Yeah, so I actually considered that going into this. Um, I initially considered doing group strength, for example, to kind of get a sense of the physical dominance of the individual before taking their photo. I ultimately decided not to do that in the interest of keeping things a little bit narrower, and I already had a pretty big survey. Um, 
But that could be a component of that, and of course could be also conflated with wealth. It could be that more dominant individuals are more effective at garnering wealth. Um, it's something I've considered, but I don't have those data specifically in this study. Yeah. So I have another uh, follow-up question really yeah. briefly, which is that it seems that the, your, your clever post hoc test of um, detecting the impression management effect in wealth assessments should be applied to the other two as well, right? I did apply it, yeah. So what I actually found is that um, there was no effect in, in those cases. So either there's two possibilities. Either um, one, there are some, um, there's kind of a lot of individuality in what people are, are, are seeing in these photos. Maybe there's no consensus. Um, another possibility is that there's really no there there and it's all self-presentation bias, um, but it's only by that particular individual and in general there's no pattern at all um, and I can't pull that apart. But with wealth I think the pattern was a little bit more clear that there was really a there there um, and everyone was seeing it, but self-presentation bias was kicking in. Yeah. Yes? I was understanding from the way you were defining in-group and out-group was based on the record scale or one extreme would be considered as the in-group, the other extreme would be considered as the right. out-group. Uh, there is a question, please, in my mind, in terms of the extent to which is there any sort of verification that the folks on the ground themselves would understand that separation in the same way. That is, mm -hmm. We might call it in-group and out-group, right. but from their viewpoint, would they, in a sense, some sense, be agreeing with, with those that you sort out as being supposedly the in-group and supposedly the out-group, would you get confirmation from the folks in some sense, this is also how they perceive them as well. Right. So what I did in, in doing this task is um, the first thing I did is I explained it um, in Spanish and said that to, to translate it is basically these groups here at the end are the groups that you feel like you are not a part of them at all. And I said they're very distant from you. It's something entirely different. And I may ask people to kind of explain back to me what I what is saying. What, what did that mean to them? What I found that was interesting, and I still haven't analyzed the patterns in this, is that some participants refused to put any cards in those squares. They didn't feel like anyone was that, that, was that far from them, that any group was a group that they were not really a part of or couldn't be friendly with. And so in some ways, the method itself actually ended up telling me something about the way people were cognizing these groups and whether or not they were something that um, individuals couldn't be a part of, that it was really something entirely separate or not. Um, but this is a constraint also with the same thing with in-groups and out-groups in the Western data, unfortunately. Is too often I think we assume what is and what isn't an in-group and an out-group, and it can be difficult to draw the line. Can yeah. I just follow up? It is the yeah. observation that folks were unwilling or didn't like the idea of separating them out. I mean, sort of suggests that at least for some portion of that group, what if they, they might have a sense of in-group and out-group, but whatever it is is not being tapped by these scales. They're, they're refusing to do it. Either they don't have it or whatever it is in their minds about being in or versus out is not being tapped by the scales. Right. But that would seem to also have an effect on the statistical analysis in terms of who do you include in the statistical analysis. Right. The presumption of the statistical analysis is that one has appropriately sorted everybody out with respect to in and out group notions. Mm -hmm. That is, everybody agrees that these are the in group people, everybody agrees these are the out group people. Now you want to know do they right. differ in these other dimensions with respect to identification of those, but if you have folks in the sample who have not identified people as in or out group, it would seem like you wouldn't want to include those, for example, in the analysis. Right, so, so, so two parts um, to, your, to the question. So the first part, thinking about who really is in an out group. Is there, um, for example, is this tapping the, that question, which is a good, a good question. Is it actually tapping who's in, in and who's out? Um, so something that's interesting here, one of the reasons I picked this method instead of just assuming, so for example, I could say that someone who was Chimane, well then the most of the time were definitely an out group because it was a different ethnic group. Um, this is commonly how the in-group and out-group literature works in psychology, is that the assumption is that, for example, uh, participants who are white are going to be interacting with African-American individuals and that's the out-group, without actually asking how people are perceiving this group. Um, so while I wanted to kind of capture that in this method, it is messy, as you were kind of alluding to with the statistical analysis, by to actually let people pick this, because not everyone's going to feel the same way. So what I ended up doing is I allowed each people to pick their own set of in-groups and out-groups. So rather than looking at a consensus measure, for example, and applying that to the sample, I could have different in-groups and out-groups than you do. Um, and what, what I tried to do here as a workaround is if individuals put an in-group in position one, I use that 
If there was no one in position one, but there was someone in position two, I use that. If no one put any cards in positions one or two on that Likert scale, they were excluded from analysis because there was no one there. That was very few people. I think there were two or three participants that did that. Um, so that was the way I was trying to kind of work with this variability in the way people were cognizing these groups. One thing that I think is interesting, actually, going back to the previous paper, the second one I talked about, thinking about cosmopolitanism. This is kind of the idea as well that there is no outgroup, that we're all part of this one social world and we're all connected to one another. Those individuals also might say that there's no outgroup. And so I think this, uh, it's important to ask the question, I think, of who's in and who's out and then try to use that to inform the studies that we perform. But it, it brings in some mess. So does that answer your questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Joe. Thanks. Um, so thinking about shared norms. Yes. Um, and so the kinds of group-specific norms that would tend to get in the way of, of coordination, you know, things like different ideas about how to conduct a trade relationship or how to conduct a marriage, for that matter. And, and, um, uh, and then, you know, like, like Richard's work, you know, they're arguing that, that, right. that then these sort of more superficial things like how you should wear your hair are sort of more visible signals of, of, of that. But it, those are, I think, more easily acquired in childhood, just like language. Mm. And I think about people I've known who were not just bilingual, but bicultural, they were equally at home right. in different cultural milieus. And so it occurs to me, this is like a direction for future research, is that, is that parents, as a kind of intergenerational strategy, and can be deliberately exposing their children to, uh, to, to other cultures than their own, so mm. their, their children become bicultural. Right. And so I just wonder, like, well, you know, how prevalent is that, and what are the what are the influences on variation in that in that tendency? Right. Well, and is that getting picked up by my other measure? For example, so individuals who spend more time away from home, and maybe because their parents took them out there and kind of said, "Here's the world, see it, go on, son." Um, so. Yes, that, that is going on in Bolivia, and it's very, it, it's very interesting. So people who think that their children should be more participating in the market, should maybe go to university, should live in a city, they're much more likely to, say, teach their children Spanish or speak Spanish in the household than to speak their actual native language. Um, that's maybe the first surefire way, right, to be able to speak a language with no accent, as you said. Some of these other norms, um, so I'm, what I'm referencing here but didn't say explicitly is thinking about um, Joe Henrich's approach to this in the, his 2010 paper in Science, thinking about how uh, f fluency or even um, ability to kind of speak the lingo but not fluently in market norms, as it were, can enable um, the wheels to be greased to form these new relationships. So in that case, um, thinking about making market norms work, it could be helpful to have that in childhood, though probably not necessary. But passing, I think, as, as bicultural is a whole different thing. And that's interesting with the Chimane. So I've spoken to Chimane, for example, who pride themselves on their ability to pass as non-Chimane. This is particularly relevant for the Chimane because they suffer a lot of discrimination. So the ability to pass enables them to then uh, be more upwardly mobile than they would otherwise. So I hope that gives you a little bit of additional Thank background you. on that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Dan. So I know. <coughs> We probably talked about this at the time that you were designing the things, and I've just forgotten, but um, Joe's question prompts me to pursue it further, which is that, that two of your measures, cause and effect, are unclear, right? right? So um, knowing the price of a commodity um, could indicate that you share the norms that are necessary for market participation, but it's not clear that it indicates that you are culturally fluent in those norms, right? right? Um, instead, it could be the case that you have some minimal level of fluency that gets you to where you have that fact about the world, you know the price of plantings or whatever, right? Um, and similarly, taking as a proxy for superordinate identity the, the number of places traveled, mm -hmm. could be the other way around, that people travel places and right. develop a superordinate identity um, uh, subsequent that, or it could be that they have a superordinate identity, and that's where right. they travel places. Right. So um, uh, I wonder whether you can think of other measures in follow-up work that more directly access. I mean, it, is there, you know, some shibboleth equivalent for um, whether it's speaking Spanish or mm -hmm. it's, you know, um, I don't know. So the the, the the people in Bengaluru that we um, worked with, they they 
most of the time wore um, rubber sandals. And um, when they wanted to say that someone was really dressed up, they would say, oh, you got shoes on the right and the left, right? That is, and it was a kind of tongue-in-cheek joke because the shoe on one foot doesn't do you any good. But just the fact that you knew how to tie your shoes was actually itself revealing um, mm -hmm. that y you could participate in this cosmopolitan world where people didn't wear rubber sandals there. They wore shoes, right? right? And that's much closer to a shibboleth, right? I, I mean, they, so, so the outside observer can say, oh yeah, yeah, of course you never wear a shoe on one foot, you wear shoes on both the right and the left, right? But that doesn't mean you're actually good at wearing shoes, as it were, that you can, right. you have fluency in that norm. So are there other things that, that more directly tap what you're trying to measure there? So that's a good question. So these data were actually collected this year. Um, so that might be why you haven't heard this before, because I, uh, I just recently got these data. So. Um, what I've been trying to do with these three different pathways is to try to find ways to pick them apart. Um, so for example, to try to find a question that would isolate exposure to markets from say something that would ex just be exposure to other individuals in general, but not necessarily with the opportunities to pick up these shared norms. And finding a, finding a way to pull those apart has been, has been difficult. So far this is the solution that I've picked but I welcome other ideas. I've been thinking about this for a while and haven't found something I found really satisfying in terms of how to tap these norms without just tapping exposure in general. Yeah, so yeah, if you wanna chat more about that, I'm happy to. Yeah, um, Lynn, I'm sorry. Did you um, test both men and women? Mm -hmm. and did you find any sex differences and does it relate in any way to marriage patterns? That's a good question, yeah. So in terms of exogamy, um, so the Chimane and, as I mentioned, the Chimane and the Mosaten used to intermarry at pretty high rates. Um, they still do, uh, but the, it's not nearly as common as they're actually intermarrying with people that actually look more like the intercultural group, so people who are from the Andes. Um, so uh, differences in men and women in terms of their behavior, um, I, I think the answer is no, but I, I, that paper is the oldest of the three, and so I'm trying to remember. <laughs> in terms of their behavior in, uh, in money, for example, how much money they're allocating. Um, if anything, I think that women might have been slightly more stingy than men. Um, but in terms of marriage patterns, I didn't find any pattern of, uh, of married people. I did put marriage in there as a predictor because I was curious, for example, if unmarried men might be more generous. Um, and I didn't find that as an effect but that was something that I was attuned to because this possibility of exogamy or of even just finding a, a sexual partner is always an, a possibility. The one thing I did do, I should note if I didn't say this explicitly, is I always had it, it, the choice among different photos, for example, was always the same sex partner, always the same sex social partner, never opposite sex. Oh, thank you guys.